Um, first of all, good morning. Um, I'm here to talk about the future for tax in Scotland, which I appreciate is a, a very big topic, so I'll keep it to my allotted time, and you can answer or ask me questions, and I'll answer them in, in, in the break. Um, <clears throat> I thought I'd start with a quote from a former US um, Treasury Secretary, William E. Simon. Um, a nation should have a tax system that looks like someone designed it on purpose. Um, you can reflect over the next 20 minutes whether you think uh, we have that. Um, if you don't think we've got it, you can reflect on how you think um, we might get it or whether, in fact, it's an achievable objective. The three key points I'd like to make today is, firstly, the tax environment is changing. Um, it's going to continue to change regardless of the outcome of the referendum. Um, secondly, we do have a unique opportunity to influence the future direction of tax policy in Scotland. Um, somebody made the comment earlier, I've welcomed the debate um, that we've been able to have over the last few months. Um, it is very interesting to sit and reflect on um, what you would like the future to look like. Um, and then the third point I'd like to make is that the implications of change do need to be properly considered. In, in terms of the detail of what I wanted to cover, firstly, um, a reminder of what the future might look like from a tax perspective, looking at the timeline for Scotland um, over the next few years um, and the range of alternative tax landscapes that we may see after the 18th of September. Um, I then want to look at what people actually say they want from a tax system and compare this to um, the proposals that, that were in the white paper, Scotland's Future, um, and also make some comparisons to what we've got in the existing UK uh, tax system, because to some extent that's what we're being asked to compare. Um, and finally, I do want to highlight some of the implications of change, both in terms of transition to um, uh, a new system, but also the inevitable consequences of having two tax systems rather than one. And that obviously applies um, whether we have independence or um, whether we have more devolved powers. So this is the, this is the timeline um, for the next few years. I'm continually surprised by the number of people who are unaware that there are changes, significant changes happening to the, to the tax system um, that are going to happen and take place regardless of what happens on the 18th of September. Um, I continually get calls from south of the border asking me what's happening, what's changing, and not, uh, people not realising that, that, that change is coming anyway. Um, there was a poll in the Herald yesterday, TNS poll, which said 60% of people in Scotland asked were unaware of the changes coming as part of the Scotland Act. Um, the UK government described the Scotland Act 2012 as the biggest transfer of fiscal powers to Scotland since the formation of the UK in 1707. Um, from 1st of April um, 2015, you'll be aware SDLT and landfill tax will be replaced in Scotland by two devolved taxes. Um, land and Buildings Transaction Tax and the Scottish Landfill Tax. And then from 6th of April 2016, um, Scottish individual taxpayers will be subject to basic, higher and additional rates of income tax on most non-savings income at the Scottish main rate. Um, and that will be calculated by taking 10% off each of the rates and then adding an amount on um, the Scottish rate of income tax, which could be the same as the 10% deducted. It could be higher, it could be lower. Um, running in parallel, of course, um, to all of this is the independence referendum, which is to some extent um, why we're here today. Um, the decision clearly is a yes-no on whether Scotland should be an independent country. Um, from a tax perspective, the, the key difference is a yes vote um, will give Scotland full control over taxes here. Um, a no vote would mean that the UK um, tax system would continue to apply in Scotland, subject, of course, to the devolved powers which we um, know are coming anyway and potentially more devolved powers which may be on the way. The purpose of this slide is to demonstrate that in relation to tax at least, the decision on the 18th of September is not simply a comparison of two alternatives. So starting from the left, a no vote, as I discussed earlier on the earlier slide, doesn't mean we're going to be taxed on the same basis um, as the UK. And that's in part because of the devolved powers which are coming in any, any event under the Scotland Act 2012, but it's also because all of the UK parties, um, or, or, well, certainly the three main UK parties have talked about what they would offer in terms of additional devolved powers. Um, and it is clearly possible to see a case where certainly a close no vote would lead to, to, to further devolution of, of, of powers to Scotland. Um, going to the other extreme, in the event of a yes vote, um, the practical response which um, we, we know would happen is that on day one, the UK, existing UK tax system would simply be rep replicated, um, albeit under the control of Scottish Parliament rather than um, Westminster. And then what would happen is 
a Scottish or a separate Scottish tax system would evolve over time. <clears throat> this slide is really just a reminder of the, the, the key promises from um, the three main UK political parties, parties in terms of um, what they said around additional devolved powers. So the Liberal Democrats have um, uh, promised or proposed additional devolved taxes over inheritance tax, aggregate levy and uh, air passenger duty. Um, they've also proposed power to set Scottish capital gains tax rates and offered more flexibility around income tax rates and bans. Um, the Conservatives have, have also talked about devolving APD um, and, and complete power over income tax rates and bans, although I think the proposal is that they will remain a reserve tax. So although the, the power over the rates and bans is devolved, um, the, the, the responsibility rests with the UK uh, tax authority. Um, Labour have proposed um, slightly more limited powers on income tax, so they're talking about a 15% deduction from all of the UK main rates rather than the 10% proposed under the Scotland Act 2012. Um, power to increase, though not decrease, the Scottish higher and additional rates of, 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 of tax, so a, a, a slight difference again from what we've got. And I think it is worth pointing out that these are, um, these are proposals. The, the, the ability to deliver on any of these promises clearly depends on who is in power in Westminster at, at, at the time. Um, so a, a no vote doesn't guarantee any of this, but equally a yes vote clearly doesn't guarantee um, the promises made in, in, in the Scotland Future um, white paper. Um, but I think it is, it is difficult to imagine that more devolution isn't on the way um, based on the, the, the level of discussion we've seen over the last, last few months. The, 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 the quote on the slide, and I've heard uh, John Swinney uh, quote from the, uh, or use this quote from the, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, the creation of a new state is surely the best opportunity that is ever likely to present itself for radical and rational tax reform, starting from first principles, which has the potential to unlock really significant economic benefits. Um, and clearly from a yes perspective, um, the, the key tax benefit of a yes vote is, is passing control of tax powers from Westminster to, to, to Scotland and it allows future Scottish governments to decide on tax for the benefit of the people living and working in Scotland. In theory that gives you a blank piece of paper which uh, I can under this, understand the attractions of having a blank piece of paper and starting again and designing a, a tax system from scratch. In, in practice of course partly because of the need to maintain stability. Um, day one would see a broad, broadly identical um, tax system to what we've got. Um, that would then evolve over time, um, depending on who was in power at the time. But, but, but given we've got the opportunity to think uh, and, and, and discuss what the shape of future tax in Scotland um, might be like, it is worth, I think, considering what people actually want from a tax system. Um, KPMG do uh, an annual survey looking at um, the UK environment, so not specifically Scotland, but the U UK broader environment, and looking at how competitive um, our tax environment is in, in, in the global world. The, the attached response is a summary of answers to the following question. So the question asked was, what single measure in the UK tax or regulatory regime should the UK government prioritise to drive growth over the next 12 months? Um, and you'll see a reduction in corporation taxes down in 4%, personal tax reduction down in, 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 in the fifth, in fifth place. Um, what, what people actually want is, um, at number one, was help to support investment. Um, number two, reduce complexity. And number three, um, increased stability. Um, <clears throat> the following graph just highlights the, um, the importance of stability and uh, simplicity in this case. Th these are answers to questions where businesses were asked to rank seven different factors in order of importance when assessing a particular country's tax regime. Um, and you'll see that stability and simplicity are the two key factors um, that people highlighted. And, and in this um, particular exercise, a low effective corporation tax rate was down at fourth, um, personal taxes were down at seventh. Um, clearly, the, the, the greatest opportunity for for change in the tax system is um, starting with a blank sheet of paper and um, the SNP have set out in their white paper um, broadly what their principles would be um, were they in well were we to get independence and were they then in power to deliver on 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 their their proposed tax system and um, the white paper wasn't a detailed tax policy document but it does set out some of the key principles which are meant to underline tax policy going forward. So the four key pillars were simplicity, neutrality, stability, and flexibility. And they also 
um, made the point of recognising the importance of corporation tax. Um, there was talk of uh, a plan to, to reduce the rate, um, but they also recognised the importance of using it as a lever um, to attract investment, particularly in competition with, with, with London. The, the, the principles that were actually set out in the white paper are actually very similar to those that were set out in the UK corporate tax ref, uh, roadmap of, of, of 2007, um, which was really the UK's response to a feeling that um, uh, the UK were actually losing, um, losing out in terms of where we ranked in, in competitiveness. So this is just to compare what was in the white paper with what's, uh, what, what was set out in the corporate tax roadmap back in 2010. So the white paper promotes simplicity. The roadmap recognises that some complexity is, is inevitable, um, but the, the stated intention is to avoid unnecessary complexity. Um, the white paper aspires to neutrality. Um, the roadmap recognises the need for a tax system which is fair across taxpayers without distorting commercial decisions. Um, you can see the importance of stability is there too. Um, recognition that we need to avoid unnecessary changes in the, the tax legislation um, to allow for predictability and certainty in decision makings, both on, a, on the corporate uh, side and the individual side. And both documents recognise uh, the need for flexibility in a, 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 changing, um, a changing environment. And the, the reason for making that um, uh, comparison is, is really to highlight the fact that the principles set in the white paper and the principles in the corporate tax uh, roadmap are um, basically core to the success of any modern tax system. The, the, the challenge, of course, is, is, is turning principles which everybody broadly agrees with into um, a workable system. Beyond the, the, the four key principles, the other important indicator um, as to the direction of travel that we might have under an SNP government was, and, and was set out in a white paper was the indication of a reduction in the rate of, of, of corporation tax, potentially up to, to 3%. Um, that's not a new idea. Um, it's one that's gained momentum over the last few years. The, the slide um, behind shows um, the, the, the rates of corporation tax in the G7 countries, um, as well as the EU average, over the last 22 years. And despite the fact that corporation tax is actually a relatively small, um, uh, relatively small in terms of the amount of revenue that it raises, it's less than 10% uh, in the UK, it is symbolically important. Um, the SNP recognised that in the white paper. Um, others obviously recognise it, recognise it too. But there, there were a few, just a couple of health warnings I wanted to put around overly focusing on the rates of corporation tax. Firstly, um, there is a danger that by having a low rate of corporation tax, what you're trying to do is attract mobile investment. So multinationals who can come in, take advantage of it. They can also leave um, pretty quickly if somebody else offers a better rate. Secondly, of course, it needs to be paid for. Um, recent changes in the UK uh, in terms of the rates have been paid for by um, abolishing uh, industrial buildings allowances and reducing um, uh, plant and machinery capital allowances. So in the UK, what we've seen is, is a reduced rate to attract mobile investment, and the people who have been paying for it have largely been capital-intensive industries who are less mobile um, and unable to, to, to move elsewhere to take advantage of lower rates. Um, and, and finally, the other thing is it's quite difficult to establish a direct link between the rate of corporation tax and business investment decisions. What the um, evidence shows is it's a useful tool, um, but there's other broader factors which are more important uh, in, in, in the longer term. What the slide shows is the, um, if you can see between the different colours, the UK rate is actually down at the, at, at the lowest rate. So there is obviously also a question when the UK rate is down um, or will be down at 20% in 2015, um, to what extent a, a further reduction in Scotland would make a material, material difference. Um, give, given that one of the stated aims in the, um, in, in the white paper was to use tax specific, specifically to create a, a competitive advantage, it is worth just looking at how the UK system is viewed, um, given that that's the stated aim of the corporate tax uh, roadmap. That was the, the, the reason why the UK have focused so heavily on reforming the, the, the UK corporation tax system. And we've run a series of uh, surveys over the, over the last few years, and the, the feedback from businesses we speak to is that the plan um, set out in the, in the roadmap, roadmap seems to be broadly working. So what this slide shows is the relative position of the UK with Ireland, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Luxembourg and the US and comparing the position back from 2007 to 2013, um, the UK went from back of the pack 
um, back in 2007 to um, uh, top of the pack in, in 2013 in terms of preferred locations. Um, it isn't just about broad principles and a reduced rate of corporation tax. There's a lot of work that went into the UK um, uh, tax reform um, that has helped um, give the UK um, a tax regime which is, is broadly accepted as, as, as being among the most competitive. The other big concern for the UK in recent years was the number of um, PLCs who were looking at relocating overseas. Um, what this slide shows is, um, uh, well, it was, it's responses to questions about two PLCs about whether they were looking at or considering moving, over, moving outside of the UK. And the question that was asked was, have you looked at moving your tax residence away from the UK? Um, only 5% said yes or actively considering it, which was down from a high of 16% in 2008. Um, those who've looked at it but aren't actively considering it are down at 33%. 62% say they haven't looked at it, the highest point over the last six years. Um, so the, the, there is clear evidence that the, the, the trend of uh, UK corporates wanting to leave the UK has stopped and it's been replaced instead by overseas companies um, wanting to, to, to locate here. And the, the aborted acquisition of AstraZeneca by um, Pfizer was... was um, in part driven, or, or the, the potential acquisition was in part driven by the attractiveness of the, of the UK regime. So despite its complexity, and, and we, all, we all know it's complex, and you know, part of what I want to say is there is an opportunity here to, to, to simplify things, but the, the UK system um, isn't broken. And, and the, the challenge for Scotland going forward, regardless of what happens on the 18th of September, is to make sure we have an environment that is supportive um, of business, um, and a tax system which continues to promote Scotland as a place that's open for business. And I'm, you know, I am an Englishman, um, not a member of ICAS, I'm ICAW, um, but I'm, I am proud to, 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 to live and work in Scotland. And I want to see a, uh, you know, a Scotland that's um, uh, open for business and is a great place to work and, and attracts more people here rather than, rather than away. When I showed the, high, the slide that highlighted the trend of falling corporate tax rates, um, I did make the point that, that a direct link between corporation tax rate and business in investment decision, decisions was actually quite difficult. Um, the reality is that whilst tax, and not just, in, not just corporation tax, is an important factor, um, the evidence suggests um, that other broader factors are much more significant in the longer term. Um, and what the attached slide shows is the relative importance of tax for businesses um, considering location decisions, um, highlighting the, the other costs, particularly labour costs, um, are much more important. I think where tax does become important is if you've got two, if you're comparing two countries which have got similar labour costs, similar, um, uh, you know, similar in every way other than, other than tax, that's when clearly the, the, the tax rate does make a difference. Um, the, the, the final area I wanted to focus on are some of the challenges faced by a transition to a new system um, and also some of the inevitable implications of having two systems um, instead of one. These challenges obviously most or would be most evident in the event of a yes note, um, but they also do apply to a lesser extent um, in the event of more devolution. Um, I am very conscious that highlighting challenges um, can be seen as highlighting problems. Um, challenges, of course, are there to be overcome. Um, if you think the prize is worth fighting for. The, the ICAS, the, the, the headlines on the, on, the, on, the, on the slide are um, a summary of the points read in the ICAS paper in May, um, which did a very good job of highlighting the key, key points. Um, I, sh I should add that each of these points, I suspect, could take an hour of debate around each, so I'm, I'm putting them out there um, and you, you, can, you can have a think about them. The, the, the first one is the role of HMRC. Um, Clear, clearly in any transition phase, either transition to a new system or transition to further devolution, um, HMRC have a key role to play. The Scottish Government or the SNP have assumed that they would agree to doing that. That does need to be formally agreed. Um, HMRC are pretty stretched as it is at the moment, so how that would work in practice is, a, is, a, is, a, is open to debate. Um, it's one thing if you're just running a replica UK system. Um, it's a very different matter if you're... Um, uh, diverging to a new system, how willing would HMRC be to effectively act as Scotland's outsourced um, revenue operators? Secondly, there's the question of time scale. Even if you just copy and paste the existing system, um, the white paper makes a thing about the, the complexity of the, the existing UK system. It's over 10,000 pages of legislation, um, over 1,000 different reliefs. Um, 
transitioning that into um, an identical system from uh, uh, identical system from day one and then transitioning to a new system um, will, will, will take a considerable amount of time. Then there's the inevitable IT issues. Um, clearly, there's a challenge of identifying Scottish taxpayers, whether they're individuals or uh, corporates, um, when you've never had to do that in the past. Um, and that's even before you think about running the system on an ongoing basis. On, on, the, on the people side, there's currently 30 people at Revenue Scotland. Um, there are 60,000 employees at HMRC. 8,000 of those employees are in Scotland. Um, you can't simply allocate that resource across Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, HMRC doesn't work on a, on a geographical basis. Um, and then there's the question of how viable it is to have the degrees of specialisms that we currently have in HMRC um, across a reduced um, Scottish, uh, uh, Scottish tax base. Um, th there are, and then there's the question of cost, and, and I'm, I'm not going to attempt to quantify that. Um, others have, have, have put their head above the parapet and attempted, um, so I'm just raising it as a, an issue to consider. Um, there are undoubtedly significant challenges and costs. The, the, the potential prize, of course, is, is a much more competitive tax system um, with cost savings in the longer term. And the, the question to be asked is whether uh, the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, I, I, I would say that the work done to date on land and buildings transfer tax or transaction tax and the Scottish landfill tax have shown that there, there are some benefits uh, that can be achieved by looking afresh at um, what you can do um, if you've got a theoretical blank piece of paper, but, but doing that for income tax or corporation tax, I suspect, is a much more challenging objective. The final area I wanted to look at are some of the implications of, on tax of having two systems uh, instead of one, and again, that could be two systems because it's an independent country or it's two systems because there's more devolved powers. And, and again, as with the other slide, um, there's a lot that could be said around each of these points. So I'm at the moment just um, putting out there for you, you to think about. There's clearly a question of residents, um, individuals and corporates. And the issue suddenly becomes important whether you're, you're Scottish or, or you're, you're the rest of the UK. Um, uh, there's, there's the question of how you identify people and, and uh, identify corporates. And then there's the ongoing monitoring um, associated with that. A board is clearly created where none existed before with all associated tax consequences. So transfer pricing um, between Scotland and the rest of the UK suddenly becomes important. Um, exit charges arise or could arise on the transfer of assets cross-border. Withholding tax issues um, uh, subject to any treaty provisions um, suddenly become an issue. Groups with losses will need to think about which side of the border these arose. Um, losses could get trapped on, on one side. Profits uh, could arise on the other side with inability to, to, to match the two. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of tax treaties, the clear, the, clearly the key one is negotiating a treaty between um, Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, but beyond that, there would be a need to um, uh, look at treaties around the world that the UK currently have um, uh, with, with, with all the countries around the world. I think in the short term, Scotland would um, rely or hope to rely on the, the UK treaty network um, longer term, you would need to negotiate treaties on a case-by-case -case basis. And the question that, that, that is out there is, would, would Scotland um, be able to negotiate uh, treaty terms which are as favourable as, as, as the UK have at the moment? Um, and then finally, there's the general point of going from one system to two, with two compliant systems to deal across all the different taxes. For, for multinational groups that are already operating across uh, many jurisdictions around the world, these changes are arguably um, just a, a minor additional administrat administrative burden. Um, the, the, the people that will be most impacted are people that currently operate within um, the broader UK, i.e. within Scotland and uh, the rest of the UK. Clearly, they will suddenly be facing um, cross-border issues that, that they, didn't, um, uh, they didn't face in, in, in the past. They're not insurmountable issues, but they would take time to get used to. So just in terms of a few concluding points, the, the tax environment here is changing, regardless of the outcome of the referendum. Um, we do have a unique opportunity, and we have over the last months, and I, I suspect we'll continue to do, to, do, to have, um, uh, to be able to influence the, the future direction of, of, of policy in Scotland. The, the key principles which were set out in the white paper, simplicity, neutrality, stability, and flexibility, 
are broadly what uh, businesses want. They're broadly recognised as, as a sensible basis for any modern tax system. Um, we, we can and should use tax as an economic lever to help promote a vibrant business uh, environment in Scotland. The key, the key challenge, um, as always, is to ensure that sound principles are followed by um, uh, real action. Um, the UK government has been making progress uh, on, on, on that. We need to see more of that progress in Scotland, um, whether it's part of the union or um, as an independent country. Um, and finally, we need to ensure the implications of change are properly considered. And again, that's implications of change um, either under de more devolution or uh, an independent Scotland. <clears throat> My um, concluding comment, and, and this does uh, hark back to the, 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 the heart and head, head debate, um, this is a quote from John Kay writing in the FT back in April. Um, I won't read it all, but the, the key point is no one will go to the ballot box in September to express concerns about corporation tax group belief. Um, so on that happy note, thank you. Thank you.